We'll open the regular bi-monthly meeting of the of MMWD Board of Directors meeting Tuesday, April 21st, 2020. The first item will be a um, adopt the agenda. Do I have a motion for that? So move, move approval to adopt the agenda. Second. Roll call. Director Bragman. Aye. Director Kohler. Aye. Director Quintero. Aye. Director Russell. Aye. President Gibson. Aye. Okay, with that, we'll move to public expression. Do we have any um, public comments that are items other than those listed on the agenda at this time? Uh, yes, I have one comment that was sent in advance that I'll read into the record from Thomas Reinhardt. Dear MMWD board members, we live in strange, unprecedented, and extraordinary times with the introduction of the COVID-19 virus, which has interrupted every aspect of normal life. One of the byproducts of this crisis is economic hardship for many Americans. Many institutions are coming up with creative and appropriate plans to provide relief or forbearance for their customers' financial monthly payments. I assume that MMWD also is considering plans to provide some sort of relief to its customers in Marin. We, like many households in Marin, have dramatically increased the number of people living in our house with children and relatives returning home from school or seeking refuge in our house as they work from home. They all wash their hands 10 times a day, singing the Twinkle Twinkle Little Star tune. Water consumed for laundry and dishes has also dramatically increased from our normal consumption. Shelter in place orders in effect. Many people, including myself, have found extra time at home to all accomplish household tasks that we have been postponing for some time. We, for instance, have decided to power wash our roof to rid it of debris buildup that can be particularly dangerous during the fire season. These tasks often consume extra water above and beyond normal consumption. As a result, I'm writing to you as a board member to suggest that MMWD abstain from imposing fines or adjusted tier pricing for excess consumption during the crisis. It is not only the right thing to do, but it would also be helpful to reduce customers' financial burdens at this time. In addition, a proactive offer of this nature would certainly enhance MMWD's image in the community as a service-minded provider which cares about its customers. Sincerely, Thomas Reinhardt. And that's all the comments. Uh, ben, I have a quick comment on that. I think we should respond to him to indicate these aren't fines. The tears. Yes, uh, we'll, we'll do that. And I wanted to um, remind the board and our customers that um, we are not, um, for those that are really struggling, we are not shutting off water due to non-payment of bills. Um, that's now, in fact, part of the governor's order, but we were significantly ahead of that order, and we are not issuing late fees. Um, so w we will go ahead and do that, Larry. Thank you. So the next item is directors and general managers announcements. Um, if, if I could just start, I wanted to note my appreciation to the district employees and particularly 65 approximate percent of our staff who are field folks that are coming in and working under difficult circumstances, continuing the work of the district. And largely thanks to their work day in, day out, um, our reliability um, of our water continues and we expect it to um, stay that way through this pandemic event that we're being faced with. And I also wanted to note that the water remains safe to drink and our customers certainly do not need to be buying water um, out of un understandable fear or concern in regards to linkage of this respiratory disease with the quality of our water supply. And that is based upon um, rather extensive 
um, communication coming from the Environmental Protection Agency, the Center for Disease Control, and certainly just the technology and practices that are put into place to control pathogens in drinking water generally. So do you want to go through? Well, I guess I'll do. Um, so moving to the board member for comments, uh, Director Bregman, do you have any? Uh, no, I, I do want to express my thanks uh, to staff. I mean, there are some silver threads in this thing, and the fact that you guys have maintained continuity of operations and projects is a real testament to the dedication of the staff who I think like a lot of essential workers are the real heroes. They're, they're the people that show up and make do and um, protect public health. So um, you guys are doing all of that. And um, I think, you know, you really deserve recognition and um, praise for doing it. So thank you all. Director Kohler, do you have any comments, announcements? We can't hear you. You're still muted, Cynthia. Technical, Bye. there you go. All right, just a little little technical challenge there. Um, so I also wanted to thank you, Ben and the team. Um, we've seen them up in our area um, frequently. Um, so I appreciate that everybody's still out there doing this incredibly important work. And I actually wanted to call you out in particular. I know that's been a challenge uh, or it is a challenge to lead um, a complex organization like this in a time like this. And I, I think you're doing a great job. And um, I just wanna express my full support for everything that you and the team are doing to get us through this moment. Director Quintero. I'll second everything that was just said by the other two directors. President Gibson. Oh, uh, well, I, I absolutely agree. Uh, thank you to everybody that's doing a, a sterling job. A thank you to Ben. You've proven yourself once again to be a <laughs> crisis manager in the extreme. Much appreciated. It's all part of the reason I'm proud to be uh, associated with this organization. Okay, with that, we'll move to the consent calendar. We have items one through four. Is there a motion to approve? Uh, really, I wanna, really quickly, do uh, we have any public comment oh, on those items? Thank you. Um, I want to pull item four or make a comment on item four. Okay. So it would be items one through three, Jeannie. Do you see any? No, I just checked. No public comment. Okay. Approval. Second. Director Bragman. Aye. Director Kohler. Aye. Mm -hmm. Director Quintero. Aye. Director Russell. Aye. President Gibson. Aye. Okay, with that, we'll move to item four that was pulled from consent. Director Bragman. Uh, thank you. And uh, thanks for a couple minutes here. I'm going to be, um, I, I fully support the staff report and um, think the strategy of locking in our chemicals now is good uh, because of the fraying uh, supply lines uh, that are uh, all over the economy. But as to the um, fluoride, fluorosilicic acid purchase, um, I did want to point out that the case, Food and Water Watch case, challenging the EPA's regulation is set for trial on June 8th. Um, and that could really undermine the whole regulatory foundation of fluoridation in California. So I'm going to be uh, abstaining on that one, but I just wanted to ex express my support for the strategy of locking in uh, our supplies, especially on, um, on disinfection supplies, which are of preeminent importance now but uh, registering an abstention uh, because of the fluorosilicic acid fluoride 
uh, litigation that's pending. Are there any other board comments on this item? Any public comments on this item, Jeannie? None. Oh, is there a motion for this item? I'll move on. I'll move on. Director Bragman? Abstain. Director Kohler? Aye. Director Quintero? Aye. Director Russell? Aye. President Gibson? Aye. Okay, next we're moving to item six. This is an award of contract for the Ross Reservoir landslide repair project. I believe we have a presentation on this item. Um, Alex and Aya, are you, gonna, Mike, are you kicking this off or is it just going to Alex? Excuse me. Uh, we actually just skipped item number five by accident. The Lagunitas Creek Stewardship Plan 2021. Oh, yeah, that, that was a, a big accident. In fact, <laughs> this is Greg Andrews after Thank many, you. many years of service to the district. Yeah. We're fortunate tonight to have him uh, walk us through a presentation I would not want to skip. Um, so with that, why don't I turn this over? So, Crystal, is this is Greg's item. Did you have anything? Okay, so, Greg, can you uh, lead us in that item? Greg's going to show you. us a PowerPoint presentation. He's getting it loaded up. And can you all hear me? Yes. Yep. Loud and clear. Yep. Great. So we're here to present to the board a, uh, the start of a district effort to update the Lagunese Creek Stewardship Plan, which was developed in 2011 as a 10-year plan. And we believe that it's appropriate to begin now to update that plan for, to com, have it come to completion in 2011. We want to briefly review why the district is involved with Lagunitas Creek and going to do that through this chronology here. That the district's water supply operations impact aquatic resources of Lagunitas Creek and the district's current involvement with Lagunitas Creek began in the mid 1970s following a severe two-year drought, which prompted the district to increase storage by raising Peters Dam. That action is regulated by the State Water Board, which culminated in 1995 with the State Board issuing Order WR9517. It was issued to the district specifically to mitigate impacts to coho salmon, steelhead, and California freshwater shrimp. As ordered, the district developed and implemented the Lagunese Creek Sediment and Riparian Management Plan between 1997 and 2007. And while that time period marked the end of that effort, it did not end the district's role or responsibilities for aquatic resource management in Lagunese Creek. And so in 2011, the district developed the Lagunese Creek Stewardship Plan to identify district actions for a 10 year period. We're at coming to the conclusion of that 10 year period. And so we believe it's appropriate now to reset the district's actions for the next 10 years. The district's ongoing aquatic resource management actions are based in district policy and regulatory stipulation. Starting with district policy, it includes the district's mission statement to manage natural resources in a sustainable manner and Watershed policy number seven, to protect native fishery resources in streams within the district's sphere of influence. State Water Board Order WR9517 itself is supported by Fish and Game Code, the State and Federal Endangered Species Acts, and public trust doctrines. A detailed summary of all of this rationale is presented, is, was prepared and is included in the 2011 Stewardship Plan. The 2011 stewardship plan organized district's actions in three categories. Those ongoing mandatory requirements of the state water board <laughs> order, actions the district would lead, and actions the district would participate in but might not necessarily lead. 
I'm going to review our accomplishments in each of those categories. Starting with the ongoing mandatory actions, these are the these are the elements of the order that go with the or with the uh, water rights and the operations of Peters Dam and the operations water supply operations of Kent Lake. They include the in-stream flow requirements for Lagunitas Creek, the associated upstream migration flows, uh, determination of water year classification if we're in a normal or dry year from year to year. Special circumstances is about us reporting if there's ever instances where we cannot meet a requirement of the order. Ramping has to do with, this, with the rate at which we increase or decrease uh, releases from Kent Lake and flows in Lagunitas Creek, supporting stream gauges to monitor flow and reporting. There is also a temperature requirement that we maintain summertime temperatures in Lagunitas Creek at 58 degrees. This is intended to be mean daily temperatures as measured at the USGS gauge in Sam P. Taylor Park about three miles downstream of Peters Dam. We release the coldest water available from the bottom of Kent Lake and it enters the creek at about 52 degrees. But we have found that the hottest days, uh, water temperatures are driven by ambient air temperature. And so by the time it reaches the, the measuring port at that gauge, water temperatures can be up to six degrees over that 58 degrees, so up to 64 degrees. But nor, most, m more commonly, they are increased by between one and four degrees. We have reported this and, and also reported that we have never observed any impact to the fisheries from these temperatures. And yet still what we're going to do now is at the recommendation of the Lagunese Creek Technical Advisory Committee, put together a, a water temperature study that's going to consider the mean weekly average temperature and the mean weekly maximum temperature uh, of the creek from our monitoring. And we're going to compare those temperatures against research that has been done on fish stresses and tolerances. That's a study that's going to be concluded uh, this, this coming year by December. We have conducted uh, habitat assessments that have led to the implementation of habitat improvement projects, most notably and recently with our winter habitat assessment that led to the winter habitat project that we finished this summer. We also did an assessment of sediment sites and particularly of unpaved roads in the, throughout the watershed. And we implemented sediment control measures uh, with uh, throughout the watershed on water district land, state park land, and national park land. We continue to do in-stream woody debris and to habitat for in-stream. And um, that was also with our winter habitat project. And we also did some riparian revegetation on the stream banks of Loganies Creek between Peters Dam and Shafter Bridge. And I believe that all of this assessment and habitat implementation work has been done with partners and grant funding from California Fish and Wildlife, the State Water Board, uh, Coastal Conservancy, and the Rivers and Parkways. I'm going to show you just some pictures of our work over the years now. This is the Winter Habitat Enhancement Project. Um, here in uh, these wood structures are meant to provide sinuosity to the creek. This picture is a snapshot from a time-lapse camera that we had trained on the site through the winter. Those time-lapse cameras monitor flow conditions and behavior of the structures and, and the creek under high flow conditions and very useful monitoring tool. Here we're unloading wood on Platform Bridge Road to go into one of our winter habitat sites. This give you an idea of the scale and magnitude of the project and the wood that we've been using to for this for this work. This is a structure referred to as a diversion vein at Project Site Four, and this project site was was built this summer, and it replaced the. Uh, habitat structure that was that failed and, and was lost in 2018. This is a very successful as aspect of the winter habitat. This is this wood structure in the middle of the picture is a bar apex jam. What you have is Loganese Creek 
flowing off to the right of that structure, but then the structure itself help, helping to buttress and shunt water off to the left and down into the floodplain that we were targeting with this structure. And this structure here alone enhanced a little over a tenth of a mile of floodplain habitat. We also implement, we also completed the, the Jewel Creek Sediment and Fish Passage Enhancement Project. Here, what we did was we, uh, this is on the Crossman Trail, we dug out the Crossman Trail, we cut out a section of the Nicasio transmission line, we pulled out a seven foot diameter busted old culvert, and we replaced it with this arch culvert that provides fish passage up into and out of Jewel Creek, as well as for uh, coarse sediment and wood to pass through the culvert and into Loganitas Creek. This is road drainage improvement work that our own crews did. This is in the cheetah drainage where they're putting in a critical dip to improve drainage on, uh, off and keep it from running down and erosion rilling on this road. And this is on the Cross Marin Trail where we put in this armored wet crossing, but also this wooden puncheon. Uh, there's a drainage going from left to right in this picture and the puncheon allows uh, pedestrians, equestrians, and cyclists to cross over this drainage during high flow events. The fisheries staff has conducted extensive monitoring. We monitor all phases of life history of the coho and steelhead and other salmonids in, in the creek. Those include the juvenile surveys, spawner surveys, and smolt surveys. We formed a uh, monitoring work group with the technical advisory committee where we have focused on how we report that information in particular, tracking the populations relative to the recovery goals of the Endangered Species Act. We monitor the stream flow through the stream gauges. We do habitat typing surveys that help us to develop population estimates as well as track habitat conditions. We do extensive sediment and stream bed monitoring that uh, monitors stream bed conditions. And we're in the last several years, we've done this in collaboration with the regional board to help to provide information for their own Loganese Creek sediment TMDL. And then we do habitat, infective, habitat effectiveness monitoring of our, of our project sites. Uh, I don't believe you're gonna get the, this is a video I'm gonna show. I don't believe you're gonna get any audio. So um, I'm gonna tell you now what you're gonna see and then I'm just gonna show this roughly 30 second video. This is gonna be five adult male coho and one adult female in San Geronimo Creek in December of 2015 at a site uh, adjacent to a habitat enhancement project, a log crib wall that we put in with grant funding from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. It's a pretty cool little video. Greg, how long are those fish? They're about two feet long. They look bigger. Wow. They're awfully red. It was a pretty exciting day for me to see all these fish <laughs> in one spot. Wow. And that's a female on, on a red right there. So I guess you did not hear any video, but I think you got the idea of it. We've done quite a bit of work with partners on uh, policies and programs for the, for the watershed. In particular, the Roads MOU and the Woody Debris MOU were the five major landowners, public agency landowners, the, the Water District, the County of Marin, Marin County Open Space, State Parks and National Park Service were signatories, as well as the Marin Resource Conservation Districts for its connection to private, private landowners and supported by the TAC. The Roads MOU uh, identifies protocols for monitoring and improving roads, particularly unpaved roads to reduce sediment. And the Woody Debris MOU lays out a protocol to try to keep wood from getting, if it falls across the road or, or on, on some place that it needs to be moved, instead of cutting it up, we wanna see it go into the creek or remain where it can provide habitat for the creek. I did mention the 
Montana Pius Watershed Management Policy, Policy 7. We've done collaboration extensively with the Technical Logging Creek Technical Advisory Committee. We've partnered with the TAC as well as Tomales Bay Watershed Council, North Bay Watershed Association, One TAM, and WSP, the Watershed Stewards Program. We've also worked with California Fish and Wildlife and Trout Unlimited on the Trout in the Classroom Program, an educational program for school kids. We've collaborated with these partners and others on early detection rapid response for invasive species, um, notably aquatic invasive species, where the Water District and North Bay Watershed Association supported on studies for Loganinus Creek, Corte Madera Creek, and Walker Creek. We developed a field protocol, and we the district now has as a contract um, um, specification for any contractors who do work in any water bodies that they provide clean gear that's been inspected before they bring it into a lake or any other water body free of aquatic invasive species. And we put together a, a brochure to help uh, the public with uh, identification or information about aquatic invasive species. We've worked with the Marin Knotweed Action Team to survey and identify patches of knotweed in the watershed. We've supported the Tomales Bay Watershed Council and their ongoing water quality monitoring, particularly in Loganese Creek and Walker Creek. Our, our survey and monitoring efforts have been brought in and folded into the Coastal Monitoring Program. This is an effort by Fish and Wildlife and NOAA Fisheries to identify and monitor at life cycle monitoring stations in the state and conduct surveys in a consistent way so they can track the populations across the state. Our community education stewardship initiatives have been launched with One Tam and the Watershed Stewards Program. We worked with Devils. We worked with Trout Unlimited in Devils Gulch to help them plan a woody debris habitat enhancement project. And recently, with the Marin RCD and Marin County on San Geronimo Creek on their uh, woody debris enhancement project that we saw during the TAC tour this year. And we've also collaborated or worked in tandem with Spawn on winter habitat enhan enhancement in the Loganese Creek. I believe between our projects and theirs, there's uh, over five miles of Loganese Creek now that have been, have had work done to enhance over winter habitat. Here's a tour of the Loganese Creek from this past January. This, we're standing on the Crossburn Trail, looking down on our, one of our project sites. There's probably a few familiar faces and familiar directors in that picture. Our collaboration with the Watershed Stewardship Program has been really fantastic in that we have had these young professionals come and help us conduct our conduct and complete our monitoring surveys. And we in turn have helped given them a great career building opportunity through all the work that we do. This was an impromptu educational effort during last year's TAC tour of the spawn site where uh, there was this coho carcass in this pool and our WSP members then donned their waders, pulled out the carcass and removed the otolith from this uh, fish uh, as we had these onlookers. And the otoliths are like the ear bone and they were sent off to UC Berkeley for a study that Dr. Carlson's doing on the uh, watershed origins of, of coho. Mm -hmm. I mentioned trout in the classroom, and this is a release day where a classroom has come up. First, they've gotten eggs in the classroom. They've raised those fish mm -hmm. uh, to fry, and then they bring them up here to uh, Loganitas Creek between Lake Loganitas and Bon Tempe for a release day, and it's quite an outing. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of fun to participate in these. Since 1997, the district has brought to bear $19.5 million on the fishery program. Uh, nearly 11 million of that has been in, in, the, in the period of the Loganese Creek Stewardship Plan from 2011 till now. And these are annual uh, expenditures and the white bars represent our, our account for the grant funding that we've had. Uh, to support our efforts um, and you can see it's been pretty high percentage. We've been very successful at getting grants and that has been a good uh, model for us to implement work, a model that I believe will continue and uh, the 
Two weeks ago, the board approved the Fish and Wildlife Prop 1 grant funding to continue with planning efforts for restoration in Lagunitas Creek. As we go forward with developing the and updating the stewardship plan for 2011, we anticipate that it will continue with maintaining the ongoing requirements of WR 9517, all those elements that I mentioned before that go with our water rights and operations and don't expire with any, any time frame. We believe we will continue with the survey and monitoring work that has been very instrumental in not only tracking the populations of fish, but helping us to try to understand the limiting factors and the driving forces of those populations so that we can then use that information and planning rest the best restoration and implementation to move forward with. And we also anticipate uh, part continuing to support the Logging Street Technical Advisory Committee. This is a rough schedule of how we think this is going to go. We're beginning this tonight with this presentation to you all. And we think that over the next 12 to 18 months, we're going to work on developing an update to the plan through conversations and public review with the Technical Advisory Committee and others. We anticipate coming to the Watershed Committee a few times to give you an update and status and feedback on what we've heard about the plan and ultimately to bring the plan to the board as an informational item. I mentioned that because in 2011, the board did not adopt or approve the plan and we did not do, therefore we did not do CEQA on that plan. Uh, we did that strategically because we didn't have the details of the plan and we developed, we, we conducted CEQA on elements as we move forward. In addition, much of the implementation that we did being grant funded from Fish and Wildlife had CEQA done for, for the project. So we think that was a good model too, um, as well as grant funding to implement work. And, and that's the strategy now to bring a plan as an information on to the board. And I just want to conclude by saying that I'm very proud of the district for stepping up to the plate and doing so much work over all these years. It's never clear cut or simple as to do implementing resource management. There's a lot of uncertainty around what to do, how to do it and how much money to spend, but we do the best we can. And so this effort will continue on this beautiful and valuable Creek. And thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> You've done amazing work. This is an amazing capstone for your career with the Water District. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, I I want to second Armando's uh, comment. I think uh, it demonstrates uh, this new phase, our commitment to Lagunitas Creek, which um, is extremely important, not only for the inherent value of the watershed, but um, Clean Water Act is under attack right now uh, by the administration. The clean water, the new clean water uh, guidelines are going to narrow the definition of uh, waterways. So I think our commitment to the watershed in, it, in its entireties is extremely important to our customers, to our mission and to who we are as a district. So I also want to thank you and uh, really give you my uh, support on moving forward. And, and I just think it's, it's a great part of who we are. So thanks again. Thank you. Yeah, I want to chime in on that too. I remember when Steve Phelps brought you in, Greg, uh, and I look back, I'm sitting here watching your presentation tonight, and I'm, I'm sitting with Steve Phelps, uh, and I, he made the right choice. I don't see how this could have been as successful as it has been without your fine hand on it for the last 10 years. Thank you very much. So just to pile on, congratulations. We've been watching this for a long time, and I just... You've done a great job, and and uh, I'm just so delighted that this is moving forward. So, it's wonderful. 
Thank you. Okay, are there any public comments on this item, Jeannie? None. Okay, with that, this time for real, Alex will be moving to item six, the award of Ross Reservoir Landslide Repair Project. Yeah, hi. Um, yes, I'm here to uh, present the Ross Reservoir Landslide Repair Project. Just to give a little bit of background, uh, prior to doing this landslide repair project, the district had to replace uh, the existing 12-inch uh, bypass line uh, that was uh, insufficient capacity to meet the demands of the Ross Valley area. And unfortunately, it was also located within the footprint of the landslide repair itself. So in order to accommodate that, the district uh, designed and then put out to advertise the project and it was awarded in June, uh, June 18th of 2019 to, uh, and it was recently completed in January uh, that installed a new 30 inch bypass pipeline well outside the location of the landslide repair area. And this new bypass will allow for water to temporarily flow around uh, or from the Bontemi treatment plant, bypassing the Ross Reservoir and maintaining the water supply to our customers down in the valley in the event that we needed to take uh, Ross Reservoir out of service. So this project kind of set up the stage for the slide repair itself. And the slide repair is, uh, right, is adjacent to the Ross Reservoir and it covers a footprint of approximately half an acre. And so this repair will involve excavating the slide debris down to bedrock, which is approximately six feet down from the surface of the uh, actual slide material and constructing an earth buttress with geogrids, which is basically a compacting soil and adding these geogrids and layers all the way up to the finished surface including uh, installing subsurface drainage uh, and, uh, improvements and also installing approximately 170 feet of 24 and 12 inch pipeline, which will be located outside of the slide repair area, uh, along with some access road improvements and some drainage culvert improvements and, and BMPs as well. So uh, my engineer's estimate for this project was $1,138,000. This project was advertised on March 17th uh, and the bids were opened on April 7th. The district did receive six bids and the lowest responsive uh, contractor was WR Ford and Associates Incorporated with a contract bid amount of $1,128,933. So uh, about nine grand underneath my estimate. So I'm happy with that. So um, this project is scheduled to last 223 days with a completion date of November 30th of this year. So with that, staff recommends that the district award contract 1907 to WR Ford Associates at their bid price of $1,128,933. And are there any questions? Uh, I have a question, Alex. Yes. Um, aren't we planning um, to put a tank in to increase storage at that site? At some point in the future, that is the plan, correct. And, and this project actually stabilizes that footprint to allow for a tank at that location in the future. So is, are you guys anticipating putting the tank at this in the same location as the reservoir? At this point, uh, no. Uh, there will be a tank at that location right in front of it but that this repair itself gains us that real estate for uh, uh, upsizing of the tank or an additional tank in the future. Okay. Yeah. So you need to stabilize the slide just to hold the, the site. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Okay. It's a pretty big slide. Yes. Yeah. Plus Larry, they need the, we need the water capacity. We need the storage. So you can't really have them both out at the same time. So yeah. you need this reservoir until the new one's hooked up. Yeah, 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 yeah. I I would move approval. Um, any comments before we move to public comments? Second. There are no public comments. Okay, l l let's uh, move this item. Uh, did I hear a second? Yeah. yeah. Second. Okay. So th Great. Thank you, uh, Director Bragman. Aye. Director Kohler. Aye. Director Quintero. Aye. Director Russell. Aye. President Gibson.
President Gibson? You got to unmute, Jack. Sorry. Bye. Okay, with that, we'll move to item seven, monthly water supply report. Paul. Good evening, just bear with me while we set up the PowerPoint. Paul, you're going to use a pointer? Do we know which screen their video? No, I don't. I'll try not to use it. All right. It's just to advance the slides. You don't have a share screen button? Uh, just click share screen and then the PowerPoint's right there, like right the water. Is it this one right here? Yeah. And then start the, the slideshow. Everybody, hold on. There you go. See from the beginning? Right here. Right. Well, this is awkward. My apologies, everyone. And there you go. And we're off and running. Good evening. Um, sorry about that. So the monthly water supply report, this is uh, for March of 2020. And before we get into the, the report, I'd just like to say that we're, we're going to go through our March uh, slides that we typically would go through. And then the sort of second part of the presentation, we'll talk about projections and what our um, plans are going forward for the rest of the year. So the first uh, table here are reservoir storage. Uh, just to draw your eye to the total storage, which was at the end of March about 71,080 acre feet. Um, that's about 90% of total capacity. And we're about 97% of normal. So at the end of March, we're in a pretty good place uh, as far as storage in our reservoirs. Our monthly production table here shows that overall for the fiscal year that we're in, um, production's up about 10%. And we're seeing some increased demand in February and March. And um, in case we've all forgotten, February was kind of dry, and so that's to be expected there. And of course, in March, middle of March, we had our um, stay-at-home orders. So there's a lot of folks at home. And I think we heard earlier today uh, a lot more water use than, than perhaps normal. When we look at the data uh, on a calendar year basis and by comparative month by month, we can see in January, it's pretty similar to 2019. And in February, we see the uptick there and March again, noticeably higher than the year prior. And this is a trend uh, that goes back. When we look at our running 12 month potable uh, production, we can see at the end of this line here from 16 to 20 on, on the bottom axis there, 2016 to 2020, there's a pretty significant uptick um, in demand. That difference represents, I'm going to say, about 4,000 acre feet of water. And we'll get back to that a little bit later. Our reservoir storage graphically, uh, here we are again, just slightly below average and quite a ways off of the 9091 storage curve, and of course, well off the historic 76 77 storage. Our cumulative precipitation, this uh, orange or ochre line is, is where we're at, and it's significantly um, below our average. But fortunately for us, 
we really care more about storage in our reservoirs than precipitation um, to a large extent because our precipitation comes in large waves and it's not spread out evenly. You'll notice even last year, 1819, that purple line, we received a significant amount of rain in May, which would be great if we could get that again this year. Um, switching to some of our, uh, our complaints chart for February, March, you can see a little uptick in complaints. Again, nothing too unusual, about 13 total complaints across our 60,000 services. And none of these were associated with algal taste and odors. Most of them were chlorinous uh, taste, large part due to um, chlorinating high detention tanks. And of course, again, in March, we had a lot of people at home who perhaps don't spend quite that much time normally at home. So that's our snapshot. And this slide also represents that it show, adds to it you know, details on what water supply is like in Lake Sonoma. They're also at about 90% of maximum storage and hovering around 95% of normal <clears throat> compared to our 97%. And so that's our snapshot as of the end of March. And we look now, as we look out into the future and try to understand you know, what what could we be looking at as we move forward? So again, a lot of lines on this chart. The first line starts over at the 70,000 mark on the y-axis, and that's our actual storage so far this year. So it goes up a little bit and then drops down where the red lines join it at about 71,000 acre feet. And these four lines that are um, colorfully arranged those are our projections. The top line, the light blue line, represents if we receive normal rainfall for the rest of the year and through to next April. And that's showing that we, our reservoirs would start spilling sometime in mid-February of next year with normal rainfall. <clears throat> Excuse me. The green line then represents 50% of normal rainfall and the purple rain line, for those of you that might be Prince fans, um, that represents our 2013 rainfall year. That's actually the driest single year that we've had in all of our history of collecting data. And the bottom line represents no rain and no runoff at all. <clears throat> so those, I think, bracket the envelope of you know, likely um, projections for us. Also on the chart, you'll note the little markers showing where our, <clears throat> excuse me, voluntary rationing and mandatory rationing are. So with those projections, what, what can we do, right? So bringing you back to this table, the bottom half is our imported water. And I'd like to draw your attention to, you know, February, January and February we will see that we have significantly increased our take. And that's part of our plan moving forward, is a very aggressive take of water from Sonoma. In fact, we're setting up to take potentially the greatest amount of water that we've ever taken from Sonoma in the next 12 to 15 months. This is a fairly ambitious chart. Um, that it's pretty self-explanatory. Green bars represent our normal take from Sonoma. The blue bars represent the 2020 proposed take. And of course, the red bars go into next year. And so our typical take is about 5,300 acre feet. The highest amount of water that we've ever taken from Sonoma was about 8,300 acre feet. And we're projecting here the potential to take almost 10,000 acre feet. <clears throat> Again, back to this chart, our running 12 month, because our water demand has gone up, right, it means, and it's gone up quite a bit, 4,000 acre feet, it's about 20% of our water demand if you go back to, to 2016. So does that mean that there's some elasticity there? In other words, 
could our water reuse or water use efficiency measures bring that water back into our portfolio? And if they could, how quickly could they do it? And I think if you look at this chart, some of the downward slopes, for example, from 2014 to 2015, shows about 3,000, 4,000 acre feet in 12 months being saved. Um, so that would be you know, a significant savings for us if we were able to implement those water use efficiency measures. Back to our projections. And the reason to come back here is really to start the discussion of when would we need to make any significant decisions in terms of water purchases. And really, when you look at these curves, they start to uptick in December and January. So you look at the blue line, and it has a pretty significant upward slope starting in, January, in, in December. Excuse me. And the green line is still a positive slope starting in December, but it's not as steep. And of course, the other lines have negative slopes. So by January, we should know what kind of winter we're in and what kind of water supply we can expect going forward. And so at that point, January of 2021, seems like a good place for us to be taking stock and making decisions as to whether we want to purchase at a continued aggressive rate uh, additional water from Sonoma. So I think uh, I'll pause there for a moment and see if there are any comments or questions. So, so Paul, if I'm uh, correct, what you showed in the prior slide is essentially front-loading our purchases from Sonoma Water that position us, if needed, come December, January, to make the decision to increase the take along the lines you presented, yet also, if we do have a normal or greater year, likely pass on that and not need that additional water. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is super helpful, Paul. I have to say this is really, really well laid out and it's very, um, very accessible. Um, the thing that really strikes me, and you went by it a little fast, is that the opportunity here on the water use efficiency side is very significant. So I know that's not what we're doing right now. This is the water storage production report, but it does seem to me that we should be, um, you know, I'd certainly like us to see us agendizing sometime soon, you know, kind of some of the next generation water use efficiency measures that we've been talking about for quite a long time and we really haven't gotten there. And um, it seems to me that given this situation and given the new requirements, well, they're not that new anymore, a couple of years old now, um, in the making conservation a California way of life legislation, this really is the time to be gearing up that program. So I'd, I'd like to see that agendized in the next couple of months. And I'm sure that, um, uh, you know, that our conservation team has uh, all sorts of ideas around this. We'll do that, Cynthia, Ms. Director Cole. Does, does anybody know, Paul, um, you actually don't show up on my uh, participant list, so you're, uh, I I'm, recognized your voice, but. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually here at the, uh, in the boardroom tonight. Ah, um, okay. Yeah, I thought the cameras, I guess if, uh, maybe the cameras are not. Uh, no, they, they're on Zoom. Which is oh, right, right, I'm sorry. So this is being on a different channel, essentially. Yeah, you're perfectly clear. And I, I agree with Cynthia about the presentation on the reservoir storage. It's That's a very good graph. Um, I was just going to ask if anybody knows what Sonoma's consumption levels look like. Are they creeping up? Are they going down? So we, know? we did have a, a, we have a call every, I think it's Thursday now with the water, all the water contractors and, and talking about COVID and a number of other issues and water, water supply came up. I think it's the city of Katati that had um, automated meters. And so they get a very instant feedback, unlike us, where we have to wait for a month or two, right, for our meter reads. And, and Katati um, were saying that, that their water use was up a little bit. Okay, but you know, ours seems to have gone up fairly significantly. I'm just wondering, do, does Sonoma County Water do system-wide information? I mean, do we know what their system-wide 
consumption is? For Sonoma, no. I do have one last slide to share with folks if um, you'd bear with me. I, I know some board members rely, Mike used to give this much better than I do, uh, but I've copied his source. Um, so the next 10 day outlook for weather is, is basically sunny. Um, highs in the 70s, mid 50s for lows. And, and that's the conclusion of our presentation tonight. But uh, Paul, I, I want to go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I think one of the things that your presentation points out also is the attention that we have to pay to these uh, dates in which we start talking about conser mandatory conservation. And with the flashiness with climate change and everything that we're experiencing now, I th just as you said, we need to be talk talking about what we're going to be doing as early as January. And also from a communication standpoint, I think it's worthwhile to, to iterate to the public um, what we're doing with Sonoma in terms of that water supply and how we're banking the rainfall that does fall here. Um, and, you know, the combination of talking about what the cost of that water is, how we're banking it, and also the fact that um, our seven reservoirs represent a two-year water supply in normal, in a normal pattern of consumption. Um, I think we just need to, I think, remind folks of that. That's all. And I think your presentation really points out the importance of those things. Yeah, I, I agree. And one thing, Paul, I did want to ask, and you're probably aware of this more on top of this than I am, but um, you probably all, all heard that the State Water Board adopted a regulation today. This is part of the efficiency um, legislation um, requiring um, water systems like ours, I'm pretty sure ours falls into this, um, to report monthly water use totals. So I'm not sure exactly when that kicks in. It sounds like it's going to be pretty immediate. So I'd like to request that um, uh, those reports get provided to the board and to the public as well. It's something we should put on the website, but I definitely want to make sure that the board's getting those in real time. I mean, we're already doing that to some extent. I don't know what additional is going to be required, obviously, you know, by this um, by this rule. I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page about that. Uh, understood. We'll, we'll take a look at it and we'll update the board at the next water supply report, our read on the regulations and how we'll handle them, including sharing it with the board. Great, thanks. As you probably guessed, I have several questions. Um, I think the issue of the increased slope of the water usage curve is quite interesting. I think that one needs a little more head scratching about exactly what's going on there, uh, whether it's weather that's causing it, or if it's a change in attitude of the consumer. Um, you know, I thought we had kind of addressed the hardening of the command demand there, or the, the addressing the mechanical um, attack on the demand, but it doesn't look like way from the curve. Um, the other thing is, I still don't understand, Paul, the logic of waiting until July I mean, you're, as I understand your presentation, you're betting on a water year that is different than this water year. And I don't really follow the logic of that because we have no data to indicate that. And it, it just seems to me to be a riskier approach than to start buying water sooner. Um, you, you know, it, obviously it's an option to start sooner, but part of the, you know, the situation that we're in with our partners in Sonoma at 90% of storage, and of course we are sitting at 90% of storage as well, and, you know, we haven't sort of done this totally blindly. We looked at our data set and, you know, which is obviously no guarantees, right? But it's a pretty long data set. And we, we, we took a segment of that and looking at the data from 1995 through current, there's a better than 70% chance that we'll receive at least 50% of normal rainfall. Um, so our data set, you know, it, it's not a guarantee, of course but it's just one piece of information that we have to help us. And what we 
would try not to do is to purchase water at a time when we're very uncertain about the future. Our strategy... Right, I understand that. But but the problem, Paul, is that you're, you're betting on the come. And, you know, uh, if you look at those curves that you had of the um, precipitation, I, I'm not so uh, much... Uh, I don't have so much problem with the precipitation as a guiding tool. That curve looks much more like 76 than it looked like 18. You know, it almost was identical to the 76 curve, just a little higher. And... I'm just a little concerned that, you know, the problem is that the clock's ticking and we have no way of winding the clock back. So I, I'm not going to make a big deal about it. It just, I want to make sure everybody's on the same page that, you know, I, I think it's, it's a riskier approach than it would be to start buying water sooner. And you may be perfectly right. You know, if a 70% odds or 70% chance is adequate, it sounds a little risky to me, but, um, you know, uh, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page because the problem is with no alternative water supply, there's no way of fixing the problem once it passes. Right. But do, do remember also that we are setting up for a very aggressive take of water. In fact, I understand that and I see it historically. So what what do we gain? I mean, you don't you do the same thing by starting sooner. You don't need to take as much. You start sooner. Well, if you, I understand the, the the benefit of not not doing it. You don't want it going over the, the dam. But, right. you know, if it goes over the spillway, we got to release water out of the spillway anyway or out of the dam anyway. So it, you don't really lose it. It just changes the where it comes from, whether it comes from the top or the bottom. It might get in temperature issues. But from Greg's presentation, it sounds like me, we got temperature issues anyway. If we're six degrees higher than normal raise higher than the 58 degrees they're asking us to achieve. It's a lot more expensive to spill Sonoma water, isn't it? Of course. Yes. Of course. But in a drought, it's pretty cheap insurance. <laughs> exactly. If that's Larry, Larry Russell's point. That's yeah, my point, but, yes. I mean, I, I still think we need to look into what Sonoma's uh, storage and consumption numbers are. I mean, if, if they're consumption is flat or going down, uh, you know, what's what's the harm in waiting as proposed? I, I just don't see any downside to kind of watch watchful waiting. Which well, remember, Sonoma has several problems. Uh, they lost 6,000 homes in the fire. They're nowhere near rebuilt. They're doing okay, but nowhere near rebuilt. I think North Marin would make more sense to me than looking at Sonoma because they're right next door to us and see what they're doing. You know, they don't have storage because they suck out of the aqueduct. But um, I think that's uh, it's a good idea to look. I agree with that just to see how they're doing. But see I also think this trend. I also think that taking the water earlier, uh, you're more likely to take water when the flows are higher rather than trying to take water when the flows are low. Which what is better for the system? What difference does it make? I mean, we're paying the same price. If they have wa if they have water to sell, uh, you know, why buy prematurely? The, the difference, the, the difference that I see is the health of the Russian River. And if you're if you've got higher flows, then it's a marginal impact. If you've got if you're only going to take water when you need it, the rough, Russian River is going to be low. And so, yeah, if they've lost six thousand homes, uh, it's you know, I, I just think we need to kind of take a look at that. And it's a good idea, you know. Why don't you think about it, um, Ben? If if that's cool with you guys, of doing a little more data massaging and and shooting this past us again, well, in well, the not too distant future. We'll, we'll um, take everything we heard and do exactly that. Any more comments from the board? Do we have any public comments on this, Jeannie? No comments on this item. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Good job, Paul. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, with that, we'll move to item nine, which is resolution 8564, um, the cost of living 
um, increase for district employees. It's a routine item built into our... Eight. Excuse me, we skipped item number eight. I did it again. Yes. <laughs> Jack, I am uh, failing as your stand-in. <laughs> you don't want me flying your airplane. You can see that. Okay. Um, item eight. This is the invocation of emergency contracting provisions in response to COVID-19 public health code. And as described in the staff report, um, given the pandemic we're under, we do have the, um, the general manager does have the authority um, as the need would dictate to declare an emergency situation that among other things, waive some of our contracting requirements as described in the memo. And we are moving forward with a contract um, that we hope we won't need, which would be to provide insurance for a number of staff to um, come down with the virus and to ensure, of course, to continuation of district operations, particularly issues like main breaks that do require some level of specialized work. And um, we all know if a main, you have a main break, it, you, you need to jump on it. So having a standby contract in place would provide that level insurance. And given the nature of this pandemic, um, going through the public bid process would add considerable time prior to getting that contract in place. So for that reason, I did um, declare the emergency, and this is to um, ratify that decision, have the board do that. And along with the actions noted, as I understand it, Jared and Bob, the board would need to at every subsequent board meeting, um, reconfirm the state of emergency until there's a determination that no longer exists, as well as, is do, will we need four-fifths just? Yes, so we'll need four-fifths vote uh, to ratify the general manager's decision, um, and then also that vote will be required at each subsequent meeting to continue the action. Does, does that mean every um, contract let under this would require a four-fifths vote? So uh, our interpretation of that, Director Bragman, is that the four-fifths vote would actually continue the action, the action being the emergency situation. Um, what we would envision the general manager doing is informing the board at each of those meetings the contracts that were entered into and the reason why those were necessary. Okay. And and don't we need to invoke <clears throat> the emergency to get set up for FEMA should that opportunity arise? Uh, yes. So my understanding is the district's already on that. I understand that Matt Sagas is kind of leading that. Um, the way that that works is that's actually a byproduct of the local jurisdictions declaring an emergency. So okay. a city, county, the state, and then eventually the federal government. And that at each layer, then the district would be able to access those funds potentially. Yeah, that's not such a treat anyway, but yeah. <laughs> well, uh, under uh, this provision, could the general manager enter a 10-year contract? Uh, should we be concerned about having uh, some limitation, a contract for no more than a year, or something of that nature? Uh, no, that that is an excellent uh, question, Director Gibson. So the way that this works is the board would be required under the public contracting code and also district code to end this contract at the earliest possible time whenever the emergency situation ends. So that would prevent a five-year, 10-year type of contract from being awarded. It is specifically to address the current emergency situation. But, but once the contract's entered, it's, it's entered for whatever the duration. Uh, yes, so, so the, the uh, go ahead, I didn't mean to interrupt. 
Well, so I'm, I mean, uh, so question. The, the question is, under the emergency, can you enter a contract that long after the emergency is over, you're still engaged in, uh, you know, or, or should, I mean, I'm not sure it's a problem, but. Uh, Good question. Uh, well, this is Bob Mano. I, I think the board actually has control over that circumstance, Director Gibson, because since you have to come back and re, re, reconfirm the declaration of emergency at each regular meeting, should the emergency come to a close, the board could at that time direct the termination, uh, cancellation, rescission, some action of that nature with regard to any contracts about which you have that concern. Um, so I, I believe the board retains uh, the necessary control. The other aspect of this that's important is that the authority that the statutes and the district's code grant to the general manager are for him to enter into contracts that are based upon the existence of the emergency and for him to take any actions that are inconsistent with or well beyond the scope of the emergency again with you know the board of directors sits astride the general manager's activities and i think you would have the ability to rein him in should you deem that to be necessary i don't mean to be impolite that was pretty polite i thought <laughs> And, and Director Gibson, I actually reviewed the provision of the public contract code. So whenever the board decides to terminate the action, uh, de determining that the emergency no longer exists, it actually states that the remainder of that contract would have to be publicly bid. Okay. Okay. Do we have any public comments on this item? No public comments on this item. Move approved. Second. So th this, uh, I'm assuming, can we do both at once, Jared? Uh, we, we should do them separately, I think. Okay. We should adopt resolution 8565 first. Okay, we'll do them separately. I assume that motion was for resolution 8565, Director Kohler? Indeed it was. As was the second. Yes, it was, yeah. Director Bragman? Aye. Director Kohler? Aye. Director Quintero? Aye. Director Russell? Aye. President Gibson? Aye. Move the second resolution, A566. Yes, I do. Move approval. Second. Director Bragman? Aye. Director Kohler? Aye. Director Quintero? Aye. Director Russell? Aye. President Gibson? Aye. Okay, now we are moving to item nine, which is resolution A564 for the FY21 cost of living COLA um, adjustment for district employees, and this is the routine item consistent with the uh, bargaining agreement that we have with our unions, um, with our union and the um, associated resolution for non-represented employees. Um, pretty spelled out in the staff report. Are there any comments from the board on this item? Jeannie, I do have one, one comment, Ben. Okay. Uh, I think we should be clear that this has no impact on rates. Th that is correct. Th this is um, embedded in our two-year budget. Any public comments, Jeannie? No public comments. Is there a motion to move this item? So moved. Second. Second. Director Bragman? Aye. Director Kohler? Aye. Director Quintero? Aye. Director Russell? Aye. President Gibson? Aye. 
Okay, with that, we'll move to our final item, future meeting schedule. Um, fairly self-explanatory, I did want to note that um, staff is looking at scheduling a special board meeting next week to um, look at some considerations in regards to the COVID-19 um, situation that we're all under. I also wanted to note that the meetings, the regular meetings and the committee meetings will are planned to continue as scheduled. We're slowly getting this technology down, but I think we're doing fairly well. And lastly, I wanted to share to the board that um, I am looking at pushing back the annual retreat. Um, technology works for some things, but for an extended once a year um, opportunity to engage in strategic planning, I'm hoping we can um, have that in person. So we'll um, push off that date and uh, see how things go in opening up over the next month or two. That makes a lot of sense. And I'll just note that next week is water week. So I hope any messaging we do incorporates that. Yes, we've got it. Sounds I good. So are, are, Ben, are we live streaming the Zoom meetings? Yes, this meeting is currently being live streamed. And a brief reminder to the board that we are planning at the at this meeting concludes to reconvene into closed session. Will we, will we be uh, moving to a different call or just staying on this call? We're going to be moving to a different call given the nature of a closed session and the sure. public access to this number. So that will be the same number that was used earlier. We could okay. re resend that if you'd like. Just wanted to clarify okay. that. With that, I'll conclude this meeting. Thanks.